Hey everybody, uh, I just wanted to share some thoughts with you, maybe prov provoke some some thought inside you, and uh, you know, most that know me know I have a, a real disdain for the whole philosophy of Calvinism and its effects on being able to relay truth one to another. There's some other videos I want to talk about uh, soon, uh, one of which is uh, a deeper look at... Uh, alternate views of original sin a non-augustinian view uh, i don't know when i'll be able to put that together and share some uh, testimony from from other uh, christian historians when that particular view that calvinism uh, holds as a pinnacle and a platform for their entire philosophy their view of total inability, they call it total depravity, where that uh, comes from. But in this particular topic, it's the, the dishonesty of, of Calvinism, and, it, and it's required dishonesty, for them to hold to what they believe while preaching the components of the gospel. They have to be disingenuine. Now, I do want to uh, be clear with a disclaimer I think many Calvinists are are saved and the reason I say that is because where Christians evangelize to the lost the subsect and the ultimately uh, spiritually stunting philosophy of Calvinism primarily markets itself to jump in and evangelize to save people, to introduce Gnostic New Age philosophy. Um, it's a rise of Stoicism, a rise of Gnosticism. And if you are one that um, pays attention to your recommendations on YouTube or uh, Google or whatever your search engine is, you'll start seeing things recommending you to stoicism and it's a thought that had died out but it was brought into christianity early on with the gnostics the manichaeans and other groups and has stayed like a virus within the body of christ sometimes it, it surges and it's uh, more discernible and other times it stays kind of in the background more so and what we're seeing now is a period in time where this thought is is uh, growing, but Calvinist, a hey, we'll we'll take a Christian that has been caught up into Calvinism, for example. We'll we'll uh, they're trusting in in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in his his payment. But we'll give them the benefit of the doubt, which is something that is um, scary to do because you really want to make sure the person understands how to be saved. But for this discussion, we'll just say it's a Christian caught up in Calvinism. What it effectively does, and we see this in recent debates and, and things making words and, and truths uh, warping them into a fashion to work nobody can understand them except the person speaking they seem to have a special lens that they're looking through and uh but calvinist if they were honest they're anti-gospel and say it's a christian that gets caught up into it and he's made to feel special elect and he was chosen before the foundation of the world to believe and he was regenerated and dragged out of his sinful condition and and put into Christ and they try to be honest. Say it's one of those those Calvinists that are actually honest and they're not disingenuous where they say one thing and believe another. They can't reproduce because there is no gospel. Their focus, if, if they were honest and they went to a lost person, according to Reformed thought, this blanket of Gnostic thought, if they were honest, and we're talking about one that's all five points. I know there's one point Calvinist out there that 
either hold to the perseverance of the saints in good works and faith, and there's a one point that you're so depraved that you can't even accept the truth when it's uh, displayed before you, then there's all kinds of variations. But say a five-pointer. If he were honest, he would go to a lost person and say, Christ might have died for your sins. I don't know. Um, if you were pre-chosen before the foundation of the world for reasons unknown, you might be one of the elect. Uh, if Christ died for you, you'll be regenerated so that you'll be forced to believe. And, you know, since you were already saved in eternity past, for reasons unknown, and everyone else was foreordained to burn in the lake of fire for something that their grandfather did, of which they played no part in, nor had no hand in doing, but they're guilty anyway. So they're going to burn in hell for no reason. It's not for their own sins. And if you happen to be one of the elect, you'll just rejoice in the fact that you were saved. You didn't deserve it. And all this other sanctimonious uh, speech where it makes somebody sounds all super righteous and whatnot. But that's what they'd have to be honest if they were genuine about their belief. They'll preach the gospel and say that Christ died for the sins of the world. Christ tasted death for every man. He's the propitiation for our sins, but not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. But they don't believe that. But they'll lie and they'll say that. And then if somebody does trust Christ, then they'll suck them in and forever they'll be a spiritual baby, unable to, to make sense of anything. Or we believe that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God, it was pleasing to God to save them that believed. It pleases God to save them that believe. And how does he do that? Through preaching, through getting the offer of redemption out to everyone. It pleased God to do it that way. The Calvinists have no gospel. And, and they've, they've come into our thought into, within the body of Christ that really is like a cancer. Their word doth eat like a canker, cancer. And it's causing the body to be very unhealthy because they can't even digest earthly things, much less learn spiritual truths from earthly examples. Um, let's see. And this thought process has culminated in this goulash of religious um, non nonsense that is making things impossible to relay truth to people. There's a war against calling upon the name of the Lord, uh, or some call it, maybe call, you know, if somebody actually follows what they're commanded to do by God and decides to place their faith in Jesus, it's called decisionism. Very popularly, uh, cast out into the Calvinistic world by a Lordship Calvinist preacher named Paul Washer and now is being further um, perpetrated or perpetuated by like-minded people. Folks that have adopted Calvinistic mindsets. Now, in, in, the, in the really, they're nonsensical arguments. You know, you can't call upon the name of the Lord. It's adding a work to the cross. Jesus plus anything um, equals nothing. You know, it's so many mantras. So many mantras. And I understand where a lot of the mantras come from because they, they detect an error where people are trying to add in, you know, performance. Uh, that you have to live a certain way to be genuinely converted. You have to do this. You have to do that. 
and it's about performance and those things. I understand what led up to these mantras being developed. I don't see that as where the problem lies. So I'm, I'm a hit it at the root kind of person. You can sit and hack on the limbs and never really get to the root of a problem. So you just go to the root problem. Is a person exercising faith or deciding to trust Jesus problematic in scripture? You know, they, they build a system. Well, the way they take Romans 2, 8, and 9, um, where it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest he man should boast. Touched on it yesterday in a hangout. The, the real truth I see in that passage is it is something freely offered versus something you earn. It's not owed to you. There's Ephesians 2, 8, 9 put in really short layman's terms. It's a gift from God. It's not something you earn or you're getting paid for your performance or your lifestyle change or any of that. Same thing in Romans 4. It was credited. Abraham believed God and it was imputed or credited unto him for righteousness. To him that worketh not but believeth over and over, it's trust versus getting paid for something you do. And it says it's not reckoned or credited of debt. It's not owed to you. God doesn't owe it to you. He didn't owe it to Abraham. He didn't owe it to Moses. He didn't owe it to a lot of good godly believers that actually did some really good godly things in their life. It, it still was not something that they earn and that they're getting paid for services rendered. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9 in a nutshell. It's a gift, and it's being understood as a gift, and it's not payment. It's not whether or not you call. It's not whether or not you pray. It's not whether or not you stand on your head. It's not whether or not you do any of these things. You take a practical uh, view of Scripture, and it just makes sense. Jesus told the woman at the well, if she knew who was she talked to? She would ask, and he would give. She asked, he give, if she understood. There's the key. If you understand, he says, you would ask, and I, I would give it to you. Not hard. Did she earn it? Nope. Did her asking somehow eradicate the fact that she had sinned against God? No, it didn't change any of those things. And it's the same thing with salvation. Let's look at an example in 2 Kings 5. And I, I, I want to help get the Calvinistic arguments out of your head. Just read the scripture and things are, are so much more clearly. Second Kings, it's speaking of, of Naaman. He's needing healing. He's needing healing. Um, to cleanse of leprosy. So. Elisha sent a messenger unto him, a Moloch, an angel, somebody delivering the message to, to Naaman saying, go wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, was it the Jordan water that actually did the healing? No. Have many people been in the Jordan? Do people get baptized in the Jordan every year? Yes. Why is it not healing? They were not commanded to do this action. But Naaman was wroth and went away saying, and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. So he's expecting 
it has to be something big and supernatural and visible and and all these things and he's angry that it wasn't are not albana and farpa rivers of damascus better than the waters of israel so isn't there better rivers that i can go wash in may i not wash in them and be clean no god had set a specific parameter around what was necessary for him to be healed so he turned away so he turned and went away in rage and his servants came near and spake unto him and said my father if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing wouldst thou not have done it how much rather then when he saith to thee wash and be clean wash and be clean then he went down he went down he walked to the river he physically did something and dipped himself seven times in Jordan he dipped himself seven times he did something according to the saying of the man of God he was following the messengers directive and his flesh came again like into the flesh of a little child and he was clean now looking at this story Would this be hard to be understood by the average person? No. He desired healing. He had the wrong idea about it because he thought that it would have to be this, this huge, supernatural, uh, visibly miraculous presentation, then he would be healed. When it's as simple as obey my voice, just do what I tell you to do and you'll be healed. You're not earning it. It was by God's grace and unmerited favor that this occurred. It was the Lord that healed him. It was the Lord that saved him. But the Bible records it says, He went down. But why didn't he just sit there? Him going down to the river, obviously he was trying to earn his salvation. Obviously, he was trying to add some hidden work to the messenger and what he told him they needed to do. Obviously, when he dipped himself, he was thinking every single time, I'm earning my way back to heaven. Or did he hear a message and he finally was directed and even admonished by his servants? If you want healing, he made it simple. The Lord made it simple. The prophet made it simple. Will you not do something simple? Go down to the river, wash yourself, and be clean. That's what he said to do. So he went down, dipped himself seven times according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like into the flesh of a child. Was there a hidden work discussed? Was there any of this Gnostic nonsense? I'm going to read you another passage real quick. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. Peter came. He walked out. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. Now, did Peter make himself walk on the water? No. Did he negate the experience because he obeyed the voice and said, hey, if you want to do this, here's the way you do it. Come. Come out, Peter. Trust me. But when he saw the wind boisterous and was afraid, he doubted. He had some anxiety going on here. So what did he do? He took his eyes off, off Jesus just a little bit. And what it caused? Fear. <coughs> he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And according to the Calvinists, what should have happened next was, and Peter drowned because he cried out to be saved. On the contrary, here's what the Bible says. Peter cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Peter trusted the Lord could save him, and he cried out to Jesus, 
for that to happen. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Peter cried out. He trusted the Lord. He turned to the Lord. He cries to the Lord. And immediately Jesus stretches out his arm. Caught, <coughs> excuse me, and caught him and said unto him, O thee of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did you doubt me? You can see the components of what led to the doubt. Jesus uses the word doubt. And right above that, the Bible records, he was fearful. He was afraid. Doubt, fear, doubt, fear. Now, the Calvinists may have a hard time understanding such a simple passage. The Christian who's otherwise appalled by certain elements of Calvinism, like limited atonement, that Christ didn't die for everyone, or that whosoever will can come, whatever those components are about Calvinism they don't like. Many have adopted this idea that you just sit there and you try to figure out if you're elect or not. And it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's such a battle to get the Calvinism out of people's minds. It literally is like a cancer and it has spread all throughout the body in different avenues. And it's a stumbling block. It's like a tumor that you got to climb over every time you have a discussion. Um, passages become incomprehensible. So in the story, in the record about Haman, did Haman save himself? No, he did not have the power. He did not have the ability to save himself, heal himself. He didn't have it. He was trusting in the one who could. He obeyed the messenger's voice. The messenger was like, do this right here. This is what the Lord's wanting you to do. Sir, what must I do? He's like, go to the Jordan. Dip yourself seven times. It was God that healed him. The water didn't heal him. His walking to the river didn't heal him. It didn't add to or take away the finished work of God healing him. Any of those arguments. But who saved Naaman? God did. God healed him. God set a qualifier and a door, a point of access to healing. He's like, here's what I want. You do this, and it's his faith being exercised and God did the healing simple did God use a man one of his children an angel a Moloch a messenger who took the desire of God what God wanted relayed it to the man in this plan for his salvation physical healing for Naaman and how for Naaman to appropriate that healing. How to, how to appropriate it. He couldn't earn it. He was not strong enough. He recognized his, his sickness, his need for healing. And God used the man to deliver the message. It's not a new concept in scripture. That's what you see all throughout scripture. You didn't need a special moment of enlightenment or an epiphany or you're sitting there on the a rock cliff or in the woods or in a cave. The message was brought. Naaman could have rejected it and he would have stayed sick. Had he rejected to trust to do it God's way, he would have stayed sick and his skin would not have been regenerated, made new like the skin of a baby. He had that choice. The truth was before him. He had to choose to accept the truth. It's the same way when presenting the gospel to people. You know, did Naaman earn anything? Was he getting paid for obedience? You know, the law had a lot of payment, recompense. Obedience led to blessings and, and payment for labor. Um, cursing 
as a payment for a sin. But he didn't earn any of this. He understood his need for healing. He knew where to seek the healing. And when presented with the opportunity and, and the knowledge of how to obtain that healing, that's what he did. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What shall we do to do the works of God? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's your point in access of healing. Everyone has an opportunity when they're presented with these truths to place their faith, hope in Jesus Christ. And yes, it's, it's perfectly okay in scriptural once you've trusted to call out to God to save you. Perfectly fine. Why would you call on someone that you haven't believed in? That's what the Bible says. Did Peter cry out to Nicodemus? Did Peter cry out to Judas? Did Peter cry out to John to save him? Who did he cry out to? Who did he call out to? He trusted that Jesus could and would save him, and he cried out to Jesus. All these arguments come from one main source which has a, a, a root back to Gnosticism, Stoicism, uh, groups like the, the Masons, Mormons, other occultic groups. They all have this idea that man has become so depraved that even his very skin is wicked and evil. That you're so depraved because your forefathers did something that when presented with salvation, you can't trust and receive it like a gift. And the scripture makes no such claim. These are all ideas that are brought in from the outside. I would not call, I don't call on Zeus. I didn't call on Muhammad. I didn't call on Allah. I didn't call on any of, of these false gods for salvation. I called on Jesus Christ. That's the offer that we have for the world. And when you take ideas like Gnostic philosophy, it takes away any chance or a reduces so greatly your chance to be able to relay truth to people. Any earthly things in scripture that teach us spiritual truths, parables, um, any of those things, you've just cast those out the window because you have this premise that they can't understand it anyway. They can't make a choice. They're totally unable. They are able. Preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power, the ability, the enablement of God. The gospel has power. It grants to everyone the necessary means by which they can be saved. Christ died for their sins. He was buried and he rose again for their justification. The whole world. And like Naaman, if you're a Bible believer, reject all this Gnostic idea and do like the messenger from Elisha. Take the facts to the person. Make them clear. Help them to understand if it's a Jewish person, you become like a Jewish person. If they're really religiously mind-based and, and law-based, 
if it's a barbarian or somebody that's never really even uh, thought about religion, you're probably better off, to be honest, because you're not having to break down as much barrier. And you just make it plain and simple. We have the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Specific good news. Who died for the world. Who tasted death for every man. Who's the propitiation for the whole world's sins. Who God the Father sent to die for the sins of the whole world. And everyone that believes in him. Will not perish. But have present tense and forever. Everlasting life. Eternal life. Don't be afraid to call people out on their disingenuous behavior because Calvinists are all amongst us and sadly many Christians are Calvinistic in thought because they've adopted a premise and then they try to, to run with it and they see down the road the premise doesn't hold water somewhere so down here out on a branch they try to refute an idea when you go back to the root. God has set forth before all men, all women, a choice, a decision to make. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and put your trust in him. Or reject him and deal with the, the consequences. Because Jesus refers to himself as a physician. Those that are whole have no need of a physician. Those that are not sick. Those that are sick need a physician. And the Bible points out, we all have a sickness. We sin. We have the ability and the capacity to sin. And it says, we all do that. Just like a person that gets a terminal disease, you can look at that person and call them, that is a dead man walking. He will die. That's what sin, the position sin has set us in. The curse of Adam's sin, which is different from the guilt of Adam's sin. Something I do hope to touch on soon, because my view is, is not Augustinian. Um, but I've never really had uh, the opportunity to sit down and express my views. So I hope to do that soon. And Christ is the cure. Like a leopard. Like someone with a terminal disease, cancer, AIDS. Sin is a disease and, and it, because of that, you're condemned by your sin. But Jesus is the cure. He will save your spirit and soul. And one day he will even regenerate and make brand new your physical body. That'll all play out in time. He's the cure. Calvinists have no cure. They talk about how there's a cure out there, uh, how they happen to be cured. But the honest ones have no opportunity to share the cure. And that's where Calvinism creates a wall from a Christian to be able to reproduce other Christians. They will not mature. They will not come to be as in the poor, uh, sower of the parable that, that Christian that can bear fruit other Christians replicating kind after kind after kind which is a law that God set forth in his creation that's the point of it it's a way Satan can't have a Christian soul but he has developed a system called Calvinism Stoicism Gnosticism there's a lot of labels of the same thing and what it does is it spiritually neuters Christians from being able to relay the truth they once held to and put in the responsibility upon the lost person 
to make that choice. It's the point and purpose. I see it all the time. I have to bite my tongue all the time. Just because sometimes it's not in a position to where I, I can really discuss what's going on. And that's why I'm careful. I try to be real careful about the arenas I go into. And because uh, I don't want to get trapped in, in a train of thought that I don't believe in. And I've been there before and it's miserable, even if it's just for a short time. So when you hear these people at war against calling on the name of the Lord, biblically speaking, you see these people who are trying to take away the responsibility of the sinner to obey God's gospel call and trust Jesus Christ. When you see these people, just know this. And Calvinism is something I've studied for years now. Those people have Calvinistic ideas really deeply rooted in their head and many don't know how they got there because just like Naaman there's the picture of the sinner and all he had to do is he didn't have to exercise a great deal of faith Peter didn't have to exercise a great deal of faith he just had to take that step of faith and believe on the Lord. That's the message we share to people. Because it is the power of God into salvation. To the Jew first, that came to them first, and to the Greek. One gospel of Jesus Christ. Available to all and for all. Provided by the God of all. Who does all the saving. Who gets all the glory. Because only he can save. Only he can grant everlasting life. It's not something we earn. We just appropriate it in the manner that he says, just like going down to the Jordan and washing. Eternally and spiritually speaking, it's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's just that simple. I love truth because truth is simple. Truth is understandable. And all this other philosophy, just like those in Athens and those in Greece and a lot of places where this stuff actually comes from, they can entertain themselves with it. I want no part of it. And I'll have no part of it. So hopefully this helps and just sparks some thoughts in your head. Um, because we really do have good, good news for a lost and dying world. So let's share it. Keep it simple. Love you. God bless. Take care till next time.